Good morning. morning. You're awake. (laughs) Must have been the coffee. (laughs) Merry Christmas. Christmas. Almost, I guess, anyway. It's here again, right? As you get older, it's like, it's Christmas again. It's Christmas again. It's Christmas. Wow. Crazy. All right. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And I heard a story. About, oh, about a pastor. So it's Christmas time, and he notices this one guy is only coming, like on Christmas and Easter, Christmas and Easter. So he tries to find his opening, tries to, you know, why don't you come back next Sunday? But as pastors do, we're looking for our opening. We're trying to find some kind of commonality. Well, he gathers that the guy was in the military. So he's like, okay, I'm going to use that angle. So he tries to come up with something. He says, hey, you know what? Why don't you enlist as a soldier in the army of the Lord? Kind of bad. But anyway, (laughs) so this guy says, Pastor, I am a soldier in the army of the Lord. And the pastor says, well, how come I don't see you every Sunday? And the guy looks to the right and the left, and he says, that was the left and the right, but. (laughs) And he says, Pastor, I'm in the secret service. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right. <laughs> that work. Could have been worse. It has been. So, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> ah, all right. The ice is broken. Uh, so we are going to talk about kind of a secret. And if you are in the secret service, you're welcome here. It's okay. But a couple of things we do here just a little bit differently than I think a lot of churches. So I'm a foodie, and this is how I relate to it, right? So um, on holidays, I avoid my favorite restaurants. Why? Well, because I have things on the menu I like. There are certain things I like to get. I look forward to it. I think about it all week when I'm fasting and dieting, right? So I get ready to go. And when I get there and they give me the prefix menu, I get upset, Right? Because it's not the stuff I want. It's like for the weekend warriors, the holiday people. I am here all the time. Right? So we don't do that as a church. Here, we don't give you the prefix menu. Right? So we don't really do that. So this is about what you're going to experience uh, you know, the following Sunday, minus the theme. Right? So I won't be wearing this shirt again, thank goodness. So, <laughs> so right? this is what you're going to get. Why? Because if you do come the next Sunday, you're like, wait a minute. What's going on here? Why is this guy going on like twice as long? And where's the like people Christmas tree choir thing? And, you know, whatever else we're doing, right? So it's also a bait and switch, right? So they try to get people in like that. And that's not a good thing if you're being a church. So this is it. This is the full course menu today. This is what we do. We're not going to trim it down too much, maybe a little bit, right? So here's the thing. Speaking of which, apparently I started a tradition of ruining traditions. Like, that's what I do here. Uh, so I'm going to start by just ripping the Band-Aid right off this morning for you guys. All right? so believe it or not, Christmas was not a thing in the biblical church, like the New Testament church, nor in the church. It wasn't even celebrated or known about till about 336 A.D. So now let's put that into perspective. For all the work, like, craziness like you know Tony can tell you former like mega church type pastor right I'm not holding that against you you're, you're, but, <laughs> but he'll tell you like you do 13 services big production I mean like craziness the amount of money that gets spent on it is unbelievable so for all the work we do as a church like the early church was like what are you doing you know well no they're not because they don't know but, <laughs> but I imagine they would be like what are you doing? Like, we don't even celebrate this. What are you talking about? Like, Easter was the big thing, but it wasn't called Easter, like the resurrection. But they did that every Sunday. So it's kind of weird. Just think about it, right? So you have generations upon generations, including the apostles, right? They're all saved without Christmas. Just perspective. Okay. So I totally demolished this for you this morning. I'm glad we could start on just a positive note. (laughs) We're fine without it because, and I'm going to give you a window into next week, Colossians. We're going to look at Colossians. Because they knew this. Their theology was right. Colossians 1.15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is firstborn or supreme over all creation. He existed before anything. He's God, right? So John 1, right? In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him. I could keep going, but I won't. You get the point, right? All right, good. 
That was quick. Could you understand it? That was New York speed. We just we turned it up to New York speed there for a second. I'll slow down. It's okay. But here's the thing. It's okay to celebrate because what we celebrate is Emmanuel, God with us, this miracle, this real Christmas miracle that God came to be with us in the flesh. So crazy. So it's okay to celebrate. We're good. We're back on track. Shirt's still on. So, <laughs> so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at what the Bible says about Christmas, not what Hallmark <laughs> says about Christmas. So the real Jesus. It's been a really big problem, I think, in our society, and these Christian programs don't really help very much when they depict a different Jesus than the biblical Jesus, doing and saying things that he never did, he never said, right? So really important to look here where the water is the purest and we get the real Jesus. So that's what we have going on here. Now, uh, we're going to look at the biblical accounts, uh, but is that, is that old time? Old time rock and roll, right? Right, okay, never mind. Stop. Wrong ministry. You gotta get back in mind. Back in mind. <laughs> Didn't I talk about that last week? Stay in your lane, right? So, so I don't get up and sing. All right. So, so in case you don't know, the Bible it, turn your ringer off, check your phones, check your phones. You don't want that to happen to you. All right. <laughs> so, uh, no jokes? Okay, good. We're back on track. Sorry, had a moment there. Um, so you may not know, the Bible's not in chronological order, so it gets really confusing. And people are like, okay, you have four gospels. It's okay, you don't have to leave. You don't have to leave. You Okay, but come back, but come back, but come back. Is that Keith? Can't see you. The, yeah, okay, Keith, you're good. I said his name and everything. Now he's gone. So <laughs> called him out. There was... Four gospel accounts. Why, right? So they're different perspectives, not contradictions, right? They're different perspectives on Jesus' life and ministry. Right? So maybe Matthew comes along first, right? So Mark is a little bit shorter, but Luke comes along and he's like, oh, yeah, but there were also these things that happened. So if we tell a story about someone's life, it's not all going to be the same, right? So we have to pick up different details. Even within them, they're not always in chronological order themselves, right? So you kind of got to put it together. We did this a lot in this series. A lot of work, right? So I'm going to do that for you this morning and explain some things, right? So let's hop right in. Matthew 118. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man, did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And he said, what? No. So anyway, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message to the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. So you caught what I did there in non-denominational church. Until, okay, nobody? No, okay, good. No. Anyway, <laughs> so... So seriously, just be real about when we read these things, it's okay to like try to think, like reflect, get into like, who, Joe, what? So think about it for a second. Like if I had that dream, I'd be like, what? I'd just forget about it, right? Like it must have been pretty powerful, right? And then if my wife came up to him and be like, I'm pregnant, but it's not by you, by the Holy Spirit. I'd be like, have you been hanging out with my handsome friends? Like, so, just <laughs> be real. So, <laughs> it's okay to have a little humor. So, okay, we're going to pop over to Luke now, because this is the chronological thing. Luke 2, 1. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the, glad you're back, Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. 
David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for a baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. So, John, the Gospel of John, doesn't really talk about this actual birth account, but it does say this. John 1.10, he, Jesus, came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting in human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human, the word became flesh, it says in some versions, and made his home among us. <clears throat> he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So this is the point of what happens at this moment. Luke 2.8. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. And that is the true Christmas account. Now, in the spirit of ruining Christmas traditions, I'm going to take you a little further through the story and give you a few details that you might not have gotten. So eight days later, according to the law of Moses, Jesus is circumcised and then there are purification offerings Mary has to give. You get a hint into the fact that they're not wealthy people because in the law of Moses, you're supposed to give a lamb and then like two birds, like pigeons or turtle doves. Those are like a concession. That's something you give if you can't afford the lamb. And that's what they give. Doesn't even mention the lamb here. So then we read this thing. And if you're in Matthew, you've got to hop back to Matthew away from Luke. And you read this thing about the wise men, or the magi, right? So they arrive, they're following like a light, a star in the east, and they arrive in Jerusalem. They're like, where's the Messiah, right? Where, where's this king? And everyone freaks out, especially Herod, the king there. He's like, what? There's going to be another king. So they search the scriptures, they find Micah 5.2, probably not numbered then, but anyway, then they read that, he's supposed to be in Bethlehem. Okay, great. So Herod's like, hey, to the magi, Go find this king and come back and tell me because I want to worship him too. He's lying. He wants to kill him. So they follow the star, goes over to Bethlehem. They find Jesus. They worship him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then they're told, don't go back to Herod. It's a trick, right? So they go away. Herod gets really, really mad and has all the baby boys, two years old and younger, killed. Tragic, horrible thing. Now, you get a couple clues, and I forgot to mention one of them. When the Magi arrive there, they arrive at a house. Wait a minute. Where's Jesus? In a manger. No, he's not. He's in a house now. Clearly, there's lodging. The other thing, why would Herod kill all the babies two years old and younger? Because it's two years later. That's why. So, it's interesting. Now, kings, I love it. Now, the kings, we three kings, but I'm not going to do it. So, stay in your lane, Gene. So, and that's how you sing it. Like Sam Eagle, I always say that. So, anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, they're not kings. There's King Jesus and King Herod, but that's it. They're not kings. They're magi in Greek, magicians. Right? Or we could think of them as astrologers. And we don't know how many there are. It doesn't say, right? So there could be 50 of them. So here's what you're going to have to do. If you want to make your manger scene really legit, 
You're going to have to bounce those kings from the major scene. They got to go. Put them on the shelf with the elf, get rid of them. Now you've got a legit almost manger scene. There's some things about like the color of Jesus' skin that we're not going to talk about right now because we don't do that. But anyway, it's okay, right? So, <laughs> so anyway, it'd be almost legit. You'll have an almost legit. Who's going to do it? I want to get the kids. It'd be great. It's like some one of the kids went home like, that's it. You get like, no, it wouldn't. That's like an antique manger scene. Why would they do that? I could really ruin Christmas for you. All right, so if we, <laughs> if we go back 2,023 years and nine months or so, uh, we're going to see that Mary is told she will conceive, right? So she, that's one of the things she's treasuring in her heart as well, right? She's going to conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a miracle. It's like this, cra- when you think about that, crazy miraculous thing, as much as I joke. Now, if we go back even further, if we go back to Matthew, we're going to find, just like that, And we're going to find an Easter egg in the genealogy. So at the beginning of Matthew, between like verse 18 and 1 there, 1 through 17, you see just this list of all these people. And nobody reads genealogies except me, right? So (laughs) I like to read them because each name has a story. And if you read the Old Testament, you're like, oh, yeah, that's what happened. And you try to connect them, and these things come to mind. Now, what is a genealogy? Family tree. So like this family tree of Jesus, right? So showing that he's all the way back there. He goes all the way, as the scriptures say here, line of David, even further back, like Luke, Adam, you know, so all the way to Abraham. So all the way to the beginning. So Ahaz, so we see a guy named Ahaz. Now Ahaz, if you're reading, uh, you know, it's again, repeat stories, right? So you have 2 Kings, you have 2 Chronicles, and so they tell some of the same stuff. I believe it's 2 Kings 16, check my work. Uh, probably 2 Chronicles 28 or so, Ahaz. Uh, Ahaz is Hezekiah's dad. You probably don't know who Hezekiah is anyway, so whatever. We'll keep going. But King Ahaz, and when you read those accounts, he's a bad king. He's really not a good king. He sacrifices his kids. He copies a tiglath Phileser, the king of Assyria, copies his uh, altar and all this stuff. Really not good. But if you look at Isaiah, where he appears again, so it's telling like different perspectives, he doesn't seem all that bad. In fact, he's worried about these other invading army, armies uh, attacking. In fact, he goes to Assyria for help. So he's, he's worried about him, nervous about what's going to happen, right? So much so that he sells stuff, all this other stuff, enlists Assyria to help him out. Why? Because there's like this civil war going on before him. So you know David, everybody knows about David, right? You know Solomon. Solomon really messes up. He's kind of a bad guy. He breaks all the commandments for a king in Deuteronomy 17, and so the kingdom will be torn from it. It'll fall, but not during his time for the sake of your father David. It's going to happen during Rehoboam's time. And it does. The kingdom splits. And so you have Judah in the south and all the other tribes. There's 12 tribes of Israel except like Benjamin and the Levites. But anyway, the other, child, uh, the other tribes up in the north, and that's called Israel just as a, as a blanket default. Don't think of it like today. So there's the civil war. And then there's all these other countries coming to war with them. And that's what he's worried about. So reason and pika. So <clears throat> Isaiah comes to kind of assure him like, yeah, you know, you're going to get attacked, but... You know, there'll be prosperity after that. It'll be okay. And he's like, you know, ask for a sign. And in Isaiah, he's like better than the other depictions of him because he's like, no, I wouldn't test the Lord with a sign. I'm like, well, all of a sudden, are you a good guy now? Which is kind of interesting. But the Lord's like, no, no, no. I'll give you a sign that it's going to be okay. And this assures him of a couple of things. Isaiah uh, 714. All right, then. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Now you know the context, right? Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And so this is what's happening in this bringing back to the genealogy. It's talking about Jesus. And this is amazing. We just kind of like overlook this stuff sometimes. I want to bring your attention to the fact that it's around 700 years before Jesus. This is predicted in a king, in King Jesus' line to a king. Right? So there's a lot of context going on, but just inside there, this is the sign. So it's a prediction of Jesus' birth and this kingly line being continued. Now, if we keep reading, we learn a little bit more about it. Like what kind of king is this going to be? Right? We already said God with us. Okay, is that just his name? Isaiah 9, 6. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, 
everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and his peace will never end. That's the kind of king and kingdom. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. So this is King Jesus. He's the only one that can be eternal, whose reign will never end. Right? Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of of peace. I'm not going to sing Handel's Messiah to you, although I want to. All right, so if we keep reading, we'll see some more. Isaiah 11, we know that he's from the line of Jesse, who is uh, David's father, there, right? So, and it says of some interesting stuff, like from its roots, a branch will appear. So from this stump, this, this branch is going to appear. Not the only place that uh, appears. It's going to bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him like it did at his baptism. We know Jesus is the seed of Abraham, like Paul calls him in Galatians. Seed, not plural. All nations on the earth will be blessed through the seed of Abraham, Genesis 22. We also know he's from the line of Jacob, Abraham's grandson, or yeah, grandson, Numbers 24, 17. I see him now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. On Jacob's deathbed in Genesis, he talks about the line of Judah and says the scepter, it all connects, will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. That's Jesus, the line of Judah. From Jeremiah 23, from the line of King David, talks about a righteous branch, again, coming from that line. Micah 5.2 mentioned it really, really fast. He's going to be born in Bethlehem of Judah. After Jesus was born, so remember the Magi, right? We kicked him out of the manger. So Jeremiah, the, all the babies are killed. Jeremiah 31, 15, a voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. All biblical prophecies in your Old Testament that happened hundreds of years before. These are miraculous predictions about Jesus and the things surrounding his birth account. Amazing. It's a miracle. Now, Christmas. If you're from the north, it might be reasonable to pray for a white Christmas. Or maybe you don't, right? Because if you're the one who has to shovel the driveway and clean the car, I do not miss that. Where is he going? I'll tell you. In Florida, you're more likely to get a wet Christmas, right, than a white Christmas. And maybe some thunder and lightning. But don't worry. The odds of you being injured by a lightning strike on any given day are only 1 in 250 million. Why do you need to know that? Well, A, you're probably more likely to die shoveling snow. Uh, <laughs> B, a number of years ago, a couple of guys, Peter W. Stoner, I'm going to read this, and Robert Newman wrote a book entitled Science Speaks. The book was based on the science of probability and vouched for by the American Scientific Affiliation. It means nothing to me, but that's probably pretty good. It set out the odds for any one man in all history fulfilling even only eight of the major 60 prophecies and 270 ramifications fulfilled by the life of Christ. So all these prophecies, right? So basically you're taking all, a tremendous amount, of, like just say 60 prophecies, okay, we're only going to boil it down to the eight we looked at today. It's like nine surrounding Jesus' birth, but specifically about Jesus, like eight prophecies, right? So the probability that these, by these people, same kind of scale, the probability that these prophecies that we talked about today, that they would be fulfilled, is a number I can't even comprehend. It's one and one quintillion. Right. So that's one billion billions. One, bi one and one billion billions. Now, I kind of, so just help me if I get this wrong, math fact check. Uh, so, so, so uh, a billion is a thousand millions, right? Is a billion a thousand millions? I, sh I didn't, I did my Bible homework before this message. I didn't do the, right? so I wasn't what I was concerned about, right? I think a billion is a thousand. Someone, yeah, someone smart and say yes, okay. So, <laughs> right, so, but a billion billions, like what does that look like? Okay, so these guys who wrote the book, this is how they, they kind of uh, put it out there for you. Texas, 
No songs. I'm not going to sing anything. So <laughs> Texas. So imagine Texas, and then imagine, so this is a little older, and you can tell because they talk about silver dollars. What's a silver dollar, right? I don't even know. People don't even use money anymore. We just tap, tap our phones and things. Tap. What are you doing? I'm paying, right? So that's how we do it. But anyway, uh, we don't even have JFK coins showing my age. I don't think so. But silver dollar is bigger, right? So it's a bigger coin. And so imagine covering, you know, something like that, just, you know, whatever. So the, the whole state of Texas covering it, not once, but two feet deep. That's how much a billion, billion, is. That, that, these coins, you cover Texas, as smarter people than me, two feet deep. Then you mark one of those coins. Just mark one anywhere, anywhere in Texas, right? I don't know anything about Texas. So anywhere in Texas, in my mother-in-law's house, that's where they live. So I hope she doesn't watch it. So anyway, you put the coin in my mother-in-law's house, cover it, <laughs> right? And she doesn't buy something with it, and it's still there, right? So and then you get this guy in Dallas, and you blindfold him, spin him around. He walks to my mother-in-law's house, bam, first coin he picks up is that coin. One, and what, that, that's how they kind of framed it out, right? That's the probability that even eight, these eight prophecies would be fulfilled. It's insane. It's like the miracle of miracles. You have to think about the timing, like him doing, and they all line up, like everything, just fulfilled, fulfilled, fulfilled perfectly. Who he is, what he did, what he, I mean, it's just astounding when you really think about it, right? Or you use that kind of illustration. Now, what we celebrate today is the miracle of miracles. Now, <laughs> speaking of miracles, do you think you're going to get what you asked for this year? <laughs> That's really funny, right? Like, so I think about kids, right? So we often ask for things or, like, sometimes ask for things like we can't afford. Right? That's what kids do because they can't afford anything. They don't have money, right? So they might now. They just tap your phone to pay. But anyway, <laughs> right? So they just ask for it, and they're just happy, and they get toys. What would you ask for? You want to share with the rest of us? You can. What was it? He has money. You have money? Okay, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as a pastor. We don't make very much money at all, man. So afterwards, maybe you can help me out. I asked for a car for Christmas. <laughs> right, but that's what we do, right? So you get older and like, you know, I can afford everything, like toys. Like, why would I want toys, right? So anyway, but there are toys. But, you know, I, I have everything I need, right? So you start asking for bigger stuff. And it's so funny because you see the car commercials, right? And like the cars out there with the boat. And they're always, like, really happy they got this thing. But, like, just my first, the words out of my mouth would be like, great, now we got another car payment. Like, that's what I would say. <laughs> like, I wouldn't even be happy at all with that gift. You know, so I don't ask for things like that at all. I just ask for underwear because I have realistic <laughs> expectations. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> but maybe some of us are praying for an even bigger gift than that this year. Maybe some people are really praying for a miracle. Could be a, a health miracle, health-related issue, bad diagnosis, something came down the line. Maybe it's for a relative. They've been given some bad news, right? They're, they're just praying for a miracle. Maybe it has something to do with your house or making the next mortgage payment, right? Like, it just it would be a miracle if something came in. Lord, just a miracle, like really praying for something important. And again, that puts Christmas in perspective, doesn't it? You know, it really puts Christmas in perspective. Like, what is this really about? Now, truth be told, we may not get that miracle. But here's the good news. No miracle could be greater than the one we celebrate today, regardless of what we pray for. God so loved the world, right? He gave his one and only son for us, right? For all who believe, like, we can be with him for eternity. We're safe. And no matter what we're praying for, unanswered prayer, no matter what happens here, we're good. We're good. It's okay. It's all going to turn out just fine, even better than just fine, right? So if you're praying for a miracle, that prayer has been answered. And fulfilled in Jesus. And that's what we celebrate 
today. Jesus is the ultimate answer to all our prayers. And here's the thing, and, and it's just, you know, we, we've talked, and if you've been in this church, we've talked a lot about, like, kind of the, the sad state that the church has gotten into. You know, like when you read the Bible and you look at the biblical church, yeah, they got their problems. It's, you know, we talk about that. But, man, it's just so far. They say one degree of separation off here, like a thousand down the line. We're like a billion billions off when we really look at it. You know, what people are preaching today. And, you know, you might have heard it. <clears throat> we don't do it here. A lot of people call it like the prosperity gospel, right? I call it the half gospel because God can bless us. But moreover, it's the short-sighted gospel. It's the perishable gospel. The Bible doesn't tell us to be concerned with things like that at all. But then on Christmas, we are. And that's like what we're putting forward, too. And then the church does it. When more churches should be saying, yeah, I mean, great. And look, we, I'll tell you what we're going to do upstairs later. You know, there's a Christmas tree up there. It's fine. Look, I'm wearing a stupid shirt, right? So I'm not a lumberjack. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, you know, I, I, it's cool. We're, we celebrate. There's a Christmas tree in my house. We give presents. But we know that it, none of it has anything to do with Jesus. It just doesn't. I'm just aware of that. I'm like, I don't know. This shirt does not have anything to do with Jesus. But, you know, <laughs> even... What the Bible says, it's unreal. They just take these lines out of context. And even though Jesus said right from his mouth, don't store your treasure here on earth, right? But in heaven where moths can't eat it, rust can't destroy it, thieves can't steal it. That, everything is, the focus is always there. Right? You have to really take things out of context to get this like whole prosperity gospel thing. When you look at just what Jesus is saying, it's impossible. It gets us to focus things we shouldn't be focused on. But Christmas should cause us to look beyond all of that, right? To the greatest miracle. I'll give you another window into Colossians because if you don't read the Bible a lot, this is what it says. And this is very redundant in the Bible, especially the New Testament. Colossians 3.2. Think about, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. <laughs> For you died to this life. And your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. He's talking about Jesus coming back. That's what we're really excited about. Not Santa, right? Sorry. You can, it's okay, I don't know what they believe. So. <laughs> I'm really going to ruin Christmas now. So, <clears throat> and we had Santa, right, when my daughter was a kid, right? So it's okay. You're not unsaved if you do that. But some churches will tell you that. It's kind of crazy. But look, this is what it truly means to be a Christian. This is what it means. Jesus didn't die so we could obsess over all of our stuff. He died so we could die to this life. It's the only way you can be resurrected from the dead. And we talked about what, how Paul's attitude, right? So if you've accepted Jesus... Or not. You may say, well, what about the meantime? What about like from here to there? Like, what about now? Right? Because we're just, we're trained to be now creatures, right? Creatures of the now. Now. Immediate. Now. Now. We, we own everything now. It's instant. Well, with Jesus, <clears throat> you also receive the Holy Spirit who will open up the eyes of your heart, as Ephesians says. We looked at that, right? You get a godly perspective on everything. It changes everything for you. You see everything with new eyes, with a new heart, with this lens instead of the other way around. So I mentioned Paul, and if you just know anything about it, I'll tell you, you know, in this series, we see just his attitude, and he says that, I mean, you can't find one of thir 13 books of the Bible, letters of Paul, if you don't know, and you can't find, like, one of them when he doesn't talk about, like, suffering for Christ. It's unbelievable. He's like, always join me in my sufferings with Christ. But Romans 5, what does he say? These tribulations, actually, <laughs> will bring endurance. And that endurance will bring proven character. And that proven character leads to hope. And it's a hope that won't disappoint like the world does. Mine, words added, right? You receive the Holy Spirit. And these things build you up. He finds joy in these struggles. Why? We saw perspective in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 in our series that we're in right now. And if you put them together, right? So Paul is just giving perspective. and He talks about all these trials in chapter 7, fears within. It was just crazy for this guy. In chapter 11, beatings, shipwrecks, all these things. Like We think we have it bad. It's crazy. But he says, you know what? 
these like small momentary, these light momentary afflictions are nothing compared to God's glory when it is revealed in Jesus. That's what he's concerned about. And if you keep reading, before that, he likens his body to fragile clay jars. And then in five, a tent that he's going to have to pack up and leave. That's how he talks about his body. And he says, when I'm here in this body, I'm not at home with the Lord. Read it. This is not what it's about. The power of the Holy Spirit gives you faith, hope, love. Right? So those Galatians 5 things, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, faithfulness. These are all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And when you're in Christ Jesus, you begin to see things that way. You begin to look at things very differently. Even the worst things that Paul went through, they're nothing. They're momentary afflictions compared to the glory of Jesus when he's revealed to us. When he comes again, he's coming back. So it's kind of funny, like, for perspective, I think about some of the things I asked for as a kid, right? So you guys, you have your phones, the direct line to Santa Claus or something. It's probably, he has like a Santa app now or something, right? So we didn't have that, right? So what we had to do is we had to get out the Sears and Roebuck catalog. Yes, I'm that old. <clears throat> we had to start circling things and marking pages and then leaving the catalog everywhere my parents were, right? You know what I mean? So like if there was a favorite chair, like, oh, what's that? Oh, Sears catalog again, right? You know, so it would be like on the dinner plate. Like, why is the Sears catalog? You know, you know, make sure they see it. Call Santa for me, right? And it's crazy. So you think about these things in the obsession, right? You think of the, the beloved Christmas story, right? You know, the kid's obsessed, Ralphie and the Red Rider, BB gun, right? So he's telling everybody, right? He goes and sees Santa, and Santa's like, you'll shoot your eye out, kid, right? And so, you know, it, like the, the report to the teacher, everything, and I just think about this, right? Some of the things, and I can think of like a couple of things when I was a kid that I was like this obsessed about, right? Like from Thanksgiving, or all year, all year, just like, ah, and the toy commercials be on every time they came out, I'm like, ah, I need to have it, right? So, but here's, here's it just like that. Like, I was crazy. So, <laughs> so yeah, there's hope, right? For, so I think about some of these things. But truth be told, like, I'll see old Christmas pictures, and I'm like, I don't even remember that toy. But it's worth $5,000 right now. It's like a robot R2-D2 thing. You know what I mean? And then I'm like, Mom sold it at the garage sale, right? Because I could have put my daughter through college with, <laughs> with all my Star Wars toys. But I'll look in the picture, I'll be like, oh, yeah remember having that. Where did he go? And then I called my mom. I'm like, why did you sell it? So it's weird. Nobody else has had that happen to them where they're like, look at this old toy and then you look it up on eBay and it's worth a lot of money and you're like, why? All right. Comic books. I had Spider-Man number one. There's a resentment there. Okay. <laughs> There's a little bit, just a little bit. I'm get Jesus tells me I have to forgive it or it's going to be consequences. All right, so we'll work on that. <laughs> it's just a joke. But anyway, no, it's not. So <laughs> you look at some of these, things, like, totally obsessed over some of this stuff, right? And for perspective, I'm like, I don't even care about that. I'll talk to you about that later, Tony, some of the toys. But, uh, <laughs> but right, I don't play with toys anymore, a lot. So, <clears throat> you know, but I don't care, right? So it's interesting like, how do we view some of those things we care? The, the, the Red Rider BB gun, like, and now I'm like, I don't even care. Well, how do we view then in the same kind of perspective, like when Jesus comes back, the things we're obsessed with now? The Bible says we won't. We won't care. It's funny. If you could go back, like, through different stages of your life, and maybe it's not, like, the disappointment of the wrong Christmas gift, something like that. You know what I mean? It's something more important, you know, like, like really big disappointments, really big things. And remember, like, you ever go through something when you were younger? You got, not yet, but when you're younger, that, like, was life-ending. It was, like, the end of the world. Like, it was, it was, that was it. Like, that's it. Just, I'm going to die if this happens. Oh, it happened, right? Just life-ending. But you're fine now. And what's the perspective? You're like, whatever, it's not bothering you. If it is, I'll see you in my office, it's fine. But what would you tell yourself? I think I'd tell myself, look, in the end of the world, I'd go Romans 5, right? This is going to build your character. It's going to make you stronger. That which does not kill us makes us stronger. Like, it's, it's going to make you stronger. It's going to build your character. And hopefully, you know, and I'd probably knock myself on the head a few times, right? It's, it's going to change the way you think about bad things in the future. 
1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And indeed, God loves us so much that he blessed us with this miracle of himself. Regardless of what you asked for, what you're praying for, what we have is an imperishable gift. Nobody can take it from us. It's not going to wear out. It certainly won't disappoint us like everything else does. And you can take it with you. It's an eternal gift. Now again, just to kind of wrap up here, that means there's like at least 15 more minutes. <laughs> That's a pastor language. I'm just helping you. Uh, anyway, <laughs> he's bound to get excited again. All right. I want to acknowledge what we experience in the meantime because this is an interesting time, a very interesting time. And again, expectations, right? We put expectations. We put all these things. That's why I broke them when you first came in here. Right? So expectations, right? So it's always going to be the same. You know, no one's going to die. You know, no one's going to let me down. No one's going to leave me, right? But they do. It happens. I'm a pastor. I don't think anybody in here has a perfect family. If you do, just get out. It's <laughs> okay, so stay. It's okay. <laughs> but, you know, really, like people pretend they do, but they don't. Everybody has a broken family in some way, shape, or form. And some are more broken than others, right? And it can be lonely this time of year for certain people. I get it. I hear it. You're lonely. You feel left alone, abandoned. But let me just tell you something. It's kind of the sad irony in the seasonal depression that we get around Christmas time. It's that we're celebrating Jesus. And if you're celebrating Jesus because you've accepted him, you have Jesus. So you know what? You're never alone. That's the sad part. With Jesus, if you have Jesus, you are never alone. And I'm preaching to myself. I get it. I get it. I feel like that too. My wife's like, stop crying. You have Jesus. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I, get, I, I get it. I get it. It's okay to vent and feel. You, we feel certain things, right? But we got to come back to reality. If we have Jesus, you don't need anything. We have everything we need. You're never alone. The other thing, too, and so I just kind of want to tell you a little bit about the church if it's your first time here, and then we'll go eat. <laughs> You're welcomed into a family of faith. That's the thing. You're welcomed into the church. The church is the body of Christ. That's what it's supposed to be, the body of Christ. He's the head. We are the body. And so we want to invite you, if you're not already a part of it, to join us in the family of faith. You don't have to do life alone. Right? So yes, there's in the meantime, and we're here to equip, support, and build each other up. That's what we do here. So just a little bit about what this church does. Um, if you don't know, and this is good for, you know, if you consider yourself a member of the family, <clears throat> you're a member here, good for you to hear again and a reminder. We are a non-denominational church. So a little, just a small amount of education, no rants, but most calling themselves non-denominational are not. It's important to ask the pastor, where did you go to seminary, and did you get rid of some of those beliefs or neutralize them? Right, so we are a church where we have people from all different denominations here, and we all believe the same thing about the gospel, about Jesus, and what's important about Jesus, right? He's God, all these things. If you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, there's your gospel, right? But the other things, and this is what Paul's also writing in 1 Corinthians, right? He's writing a lot. Don't, don't divide over the pastor and who you think the better pastor is. You know, so 8 through 10, meet sacrifice, different issues that they'd have, what we call secondary doctrine. Don't argue about that. One of those things is the Sabbath, right? And I say this all the time. Yet now... You have people will say, no, you can't, you're not saved, you can't come to this church unless you observe like the seventh-day Sabbath, like the Ten Commandments. What? Paul, the Bible 
says don't divide over that, right? So that's a non-denominational church. So it means we are a drama-free church. Imagine that, a family with no drama. Drama people don't stay here. And so we lose a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because we don't deal with it. I don't deal with it. No. No. Right? I do not deal. You can have problems. We can meet in my office. You can cry. Talk about problems. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about now you're making everybody's life difficult. Because, you know, no. Right? Or complaining or this and that. Stop it. This is awesome that we even have this. Right? So drama. We're also the expectations. We're clearly not trying to be a mega church. But a lot of people are. And there's always scandals in the megachurch. Why? The money, the this, right? All this other stuff. Trying to get rich and famous. When somebody like me is trying to get rich and famous off the church, you can't see the problem with that? Unbelievable. But of course they have a problem, right? My wife and I, if you know our stories, we're over it. <laughs> Been there, done that. And if you know our stories, we were saved through the church, both physically and spiritually. I said this a couple weeks ago, right on the stage. My wife would be dead if it was not for this church. What do I owe it? My life. Everything. So we have changed a lot and just devoted our lives to it. That's what we're all about. It's not about anything else. Been there, done that. So we live to share that experience with other people. That's it. I want other people. I'm not going to be selfish. Be like, yes, I'm set. You know, see ya. You know what I mean? No. Right? I want to share that with you. If you don't know Jesus yet, I want to share. I want to get you there. Right? Change your perspective. So <clears throat> part of my wife's story is recovery. Right? So we've been sober nine years. It's going to be ten years in April. So April 30th. It's pretty good, right? All right. So good with dates. Just showing off there. Uh, but I'm not always good with dates. <laughs> right? Sober for that long. Right? So we host recovery meetings here. All right, and so we're trying to get more of them going on. Sober events, when you see the cafe upstairs, it's not like, it's sobriety is not a punishment, right? It's not, you think like, a, I'm going to sit in a lawn chair in a high school gym. You know, no, it's really nice up there. And there's like pool tables and all kinds of cool stuff. It's an alternative to hang out in a place where you're going to get yourself in trouble. All right? Another thing we do is we like to feed people. So we'll feed you today. I hear the food's pretty good. So <laughs> the insiders know what I'm doing. Coffee mug. It's a boast. It's not really pride. So <laughs> anyway, so we like to feed people. Uh, the other thing here, again, on divide, we don't, we don't see socioeconomic status here. We don't see race here. We don't, we don't, nope, we don't do that here. We don't do that here. We all sit and eat together. We're not a program church where we patronize certain groups of needy people. Right? We don't do that either. If you're Poor, you're part of the family. If you're rich, you're part of the family. If you're homeless, you're part of the family. And how can we help? That's it. We're all the same. And we sit down and eat together. We cook for one another. We fellowship with one another. That's what we're all about. All right? A real body of Christ genuinely here for Jesus. So if you don't have anyone to celebrate Christmas with this year, you can celebrate it with us right after the service. All right? We have a Christmas tree and everything. And if you want a present, ask my wife. She'll buy you one. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. God bless you. I love all of you. Thank you for coming and spending the time with us, investing the time with us. Have a Merry Christmas. Enjoy whatever it is that you're doing. I know a lot of people have lunch plans. That's fine. I love lunch here in Naples. But just pass through the cafe, even if you do. Say hi. See what we're all about. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank everyone. Thank you for everyone who came in here, for sending everyone who came in here. And I just hope you open the eyes of their hearts, Lord, so that they can receive your spirit if they haven't already. If they have, remind them that they are not alone. They are not alone. Even with nothing else, they have you. And Lord, we thank you for that gift so much. Be with us as we go out this week. Encourage us. Equip us and build us up so that we can be better messengers for your gospel. That is the good news. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.